Welcome to a brief lecture on rum production. Rum is simple on paper because of the restrictions being mostly around the raw materials used to produce it. However, there are a lot of variety within those raw materials. Rum also lacks specific process requirements, and this is where the nuance and variety comes from. Different combinations of the allowed materials, choosing the right yeast for the desired fermentation style, and the type of stills used, combined with different maturation techniques, all lead to a variety of potential sensory properties that make rum not only a delicious drink, but a fun and challenging product to craft. Before we begin, I just want to walk you through what I intend to cover in this lecture. Um, we'll start with a brief introduction of who I am and what makes a rum a rum, jumping into the raw materials that can be used. Once we go through the basics uh, of the raw materials, I'll talk about using those materials into a fermentation and the different challenges that you may encounter that aren't always present uh, depending on the sugar sources you're using. After fermentation, we'll move into distillation, covering the different types of equipment used, how to and when to make your cuts, and the variety of interesting uses for the byproducts created. Post distillation, we'll talk about the different methods and techniques for maturation and embodying color and flavor into rums. Finally, we'll go into different sensory properties that are typically associated with rums and their different styles. Well, uh, my name is Austin Adamson. I'm co-owner and distiller of Balmer Peak Distillery here in Lakewood, Colorado. I've been working professionally with rum uh, across two different distilleries here in, in Colorado. Um, I've distilled uh, over six officially labeled rum products um, and then eight spirits that are based on rum but not called rum. Um, over half of those were my own recipes and currently I'm in the process of developing three more rums that should be labeled within the, uh, the next several months. So let's start with the raw materials. Raw materials used to produce a rum are predominantly what makes a rum a rum. The basic greed upon principle ingredient for rum is as simple as sugar cane and the byproducts thereof. Whereas tequila, bourbon, cognac, all must be made in a specific country, rum doesn't have any regional requirements and doesn't have a unified worldly agreement on what truly defines a rum. Depending on which country you're in, you can run into different examples. Canadian produced rum must be aged in small wood to be classified as rum. In Brazil, rum must be from a single distillation of sugarcane fermentation to a range of 35 to 54 percent alcohol by volume. Brazil also has additional classifications of sugarcane distillates, including cachaça and aguardente. Germany has a classification for rum verschnitt or rum blend, which is a neutral spirit made from grain, sugar beets, potatoes, or other non-cane sugar that is then blended with 5% of real rum, typically imported from Jamaica. For the purpose of simplicity, um, and being based in the United States myself, I'll be using the TTB's definition of rum. The TTB mandates that to call a spirit a rum in the United States, it must meet these criteria. Spirits distilled from fermented juice of sugarcane, sugarcane syrup, sugarcane molasses, or other sugarcane byproducts at less than 95% alcohol by volume, 190 proof, having the taste, aroma, and characteristics generally attributed to rum and bottled not less than 40% alcohol by volume. Even with all the slight changes and differences in the definitions across the world, the most important component of calling a spirit rum 
is that it's distilled from a sugarcane fermentation. Luckily for rum producers, there are a lot of variants within the types of sugarcane and byproducts from processing sugarcane. Each type of cane product is going to impart different flavors and impose different challenges through the distillation and fermentation process. Starting with the freshest source, sugarcane can be pressed into juice. That sweet sugarcane juice is the sole base fermentation in what is traditionally known as a rum agricole. Sugarcane juice contains a high amount and variety of vitamins and minerals, including vitamin B5, vitamin B6, manganese, magnesium, iron, potassium, calcium, as well as sugars in the form of sucrose, glucose, and fructose. These complexities are what give rums made from a pure sugarcane juice fermentation their more earthy vegetal flavors. These rum agricoles are often denoted by the H following the R in rum, which is the French way to spell rum. They are more difficult to produce the further you get away from cultivated sugarcane farms, mostly in part because sugarcane is very quick to self-ferment. And the increased cost of transporting, transporting the liquid needed to distilleries at greater distances. The most common base around the world for rums is molasses. This thick, dark syrup is a byproduct from the sugar refinement process and contains a concentration of the vitamins and minerals found within the sugarcane product, but lacks the same vegetal freshness that you'll get from sugarcane juice. As the sugarcane is processed, it's boiled down and reduced into a syrup. Sugar crystals are then extracted leaving behind the dark syrup we know as molasses. Sometimes sulfur dioxide is added to the molasses for uh, preservation reasons, uh, but these types of molasses aren't very common for beverage or food creation and should be avoided when making a rum. Sulfur dioxide increases the risk of unwanted, easy to detect flavors throughout fermentation and the subsequent distillation. Different varieties of molasses exist, and depending on uh, what stage of the sugarcane process the molasses is collected at. Most are put into a few different categories, light, dark, and black strap being the darkest. Uh, the darker the molasses, the higher mi the mineral content, and the lower the sugar content. Some molasses suppliers offer a premium molasses designed to work for rum fermentations and what that means is that they've usually filtered a lot of the um, ash and other uh, inconsistencies and this process is to aid in the repeatability of a, of a rum. The more you refine the sugarcane uh, the higher amount of pure sucrose you're going to be left with. Uh, that, that's what traditional white table sugar is. Um, some less refined sugar products uh, like brown sugar, turbinado, demerara, panela, raw sugar. It goes by, there's a ton of different names and, a, and a slightly differences in each um, are mostly dependent on the processing techniques and the amount of molasses that is present within that sugar. Um, when experimenting with your own rum recipe, uh, I, I would say uh, try playing with pure fermentations of each sugar source. See if you're able to then identify different flavors. Use the same yeast through the same um, through, this, through the trial, and um, when doing this, you'll be quick to notice how 
white sugar or refined sugar has a very distinctive taste to it that is detectable even when distilled with other sugarcane products. Um, again, when you're when you're out at the liquor store or um, t- at a rum event, try finding out the source of the fermentation, and when you taste the rum, see if you're able to identify commonalities between a pure molasses fermentation uh, versus a maybe a molasses sucanat blend or other types of sugarcane fermentations. So apart from sugarcane, the yeast is going to be your second most important component in crafting a rum. Ultimately, feeding sugarcane to yeast is what produces the alcohol, which then becomes rum. However, not all strains uh, of yeast will handle the sugars found in sugarcane as well as others. So there's a lot of yeast that have been developed and cultivated that work best with maltose, uh, like a majority of ale yeasts. They're far less effective when dealing with sugars like glucose and sucrose, uh, and therefore require stronger doses or even staggered doses of nutrients. So these yeasts that are used for beer production, they can have some really cool flavors and esters that would contribute a lot to the flavor profile of an interesting rum. However, in part with the maltose uh, dependencies, they're also not as strong when converting sugars and uh, attenuating to a larger amount of alcohol. So a lot of these ale yeasts will actually slow down or stop altogether when it surpasses the 5% alcohol by volume mark. Wine yeasts are a good place to start because, well, wine wine are common wine yeasts are commonly used in making rum because of their their high tolerance to alcohol production. Um, when when you're making a rum, you can you'll start uh, with a lot more available sugars and have a much higher potential to create a more alcoholic solution. Uh, wine yeasts also are more apt to dealing with the types of sugars from sugarcane, and because of that, they are more relaxed on the uh, supplement of uh, nutrients. So you should also try and avoid using um, yeasts that label themselves as turbo yeasts especially when you're trying to make a flavorful rum from the fermentation and distillation. Uh, If you're planning on just flavoring your rum or doing a lot to it prior, just prior to bottling and you want more of a neutral spirit, then turbo yeast is is great for that because they're designed to provide minimal esters and flavors and producing the largest amounts of alcohol. Um, If you, you know, if you have to, if you feel like you need to use or want to use turbo yeast, I would say um, you can use it as a secondary pitch. So uh, use your desired flavor profile yeast first, and then maybe 12 to 24 hours in, um, if you're looking for a faster ferment time, what you can do is um, add this secondary pitch of, of a turbo yeast uh, to finish up your fermentation to meet your schedules or, or production goals and uh, to, to complete the uh, desired attenuation. Because the type of yeast you, you end up using is going to have a major impact on your final product. It's where you know a lot of that flavor comes from is in those, those byproducts of the yeast. 
So the sugar cane and the the type of sugar cane product you use and the type of yeast are going to be the two strongest contributing factors to your flavor of your rum. So determining the style of rum you're looking for, that's going to have a large impact on your fermentation preparation and the style of fermentation you use. So as we talked about, the, the majority of flavors come from those solids within the sugar cane. And that's why the freshly squeezed sugar cane juice and the extra concentrated molasses will yield the most intense flavor profiles. Reducing the amount of solids by supplementing with more refined sugars can result in a higher alcohol yield, but you're going to achieve that at a loss of flavor. So, for example, if you do 75% uh, molasses and 25% refined sugar, you're going to notice a difference in, a, in flavor if you were just to do a full molasses fermentation. When you add more refined sugars, you're going to result in a much more milder flavor profile. But regardless of what style of sugar cane you use, uh, fermentation best practices are still applied here. That means starting off with all your equipment that will be coming in contact with the wash or the fermentation to be sanitized or sterilized. Uh, that includes the water that you use to dilute or dissolve your sugars into. This just helps present, prevent unwanted and unknown bacteria and wild yeast from imparting uncontrolled flavors. Sometimes those wild bacteria and those wild yeasts are desirable. Uh, and that's why you can go with an open fermentation. But you don't want a lot of batch variants. So you don't want unknown extreme quantities uh, from dirty or um, kind of tainted equipment to just offer a, a huge variance between batches. Uh, so creating a rum with a high ester profile, which is traditional Jamaican style, incorporates the use of dunder. Um, dunder from a muck pit, which has been growing and collecting wild yeast and bacteria, which then imparts those acids and esters into the final product. So the, the dunder or stillage backset, that liquid from the first distillation of a rum, is stored in containers um, or pits, often referred to as muck pits. Um, I, I use a, a polydrum, a 55 gallon polydrum for our dunder, and we keep it exposed to the air. What that does is it lets wild yeast and bacteria kind of land in there and add to the, to the local biome of the, the muck pit. Um, so these pits are often given a sugar source, uh, traditionally in the form of sugarcane husks or you know, clippings of, of the sugar cane plant that aren't, aren't used, and the muck pit is never entirely emptied. This, this helps, um, you know, you'll take 10 gallons of dunder in with a new batch, ferment, distill, then replenish that dunder with, with that um, when you're done, and kind of keeping the uh, microbiome continuously thriving and that same uh, flavor profile for future batches. So when it comes to getting your sugar cane ready for fermentation, again, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, it's not as complicated as doing a grain fermentation in, in this sense because your sugars are already converted. You don't have to worry about um, rest times. Um, the only thing you should be weary about is um, sterilizing your sugarcane. So 
depending on what level of refinement of your sugarcane product, there there's going to be bacteria and you know fungus present throughout the 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 sugarcane. So just heating it to um, you know heating it with your water mixture to about 185 degrees Fahrenheit just ensures that these trace amounts of bacteria and fungi aren't giving your yeast unwanted and uncontrolled competition. Again, these wild bacteria and yeast, fungi, they can embody a lot of interesting flavors into your product, but if you don't know they're there, it's hard to repeat the flavor profiles between batches. And so good practices of sterilization and sanitation ensure that um, you're able to repeat the same product uh, time and time again. So also during this, um, this first step of, of dissolving or heating your, your sugarcane product, this is, would be the time to add other nutrients and um, compounds for acidity controlling. So depending on the rum you're making, um, you know, like if you're making a, a rum with dunder, that can act as your your acidity control. Um, so uh, you, a target, a good target for um, for a rum fermentation start is with a pH between four point nine and five point one. Um, you can tweak it with, by adding more more dunder, you know, making it more acidic or, um, you know, supplementing with citric acid if you're, if you're going for a clean dunderless batch. So uh, I mentioned adding nutrients. Nutrients are very important for the yeast, um, for the yeast to be happy and healthy. Uh, nutrients that are particularly important in uh, molasses or sugarcane fermentations are carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, zinc, potassium at a very high uh, requirement, uh, followed by magnesium, iron, sulfur, ca and calcium in lesser amounts. So when you're using a predominantly molasses-based fermentation, the yeast often encounter deficiencies in nitrogen and phosphorus, and this will lead to a stalled or very slow fermentation. Um, I ran into this a few times in recipe creation. Uh, luckily, these nutrients can be supplemented. So, you know, by using a full spectrum nutrient like superfood or Fermade K, uh, I personally use superfood here. Um, and then the additional supplement of diammonium phosphate, DAP. Uh, that's how you can get the nitrogen levels to a point where your yeast will be comfortable working more efficiently. The, so the ideal conditions for your you know, basic rum fermentation are going to vary depending on what yeast you've selected. Uh, a common optimal temperature is right around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. This will keep most yeast comfortable. You know, it, in, a, in a temperature range that will fluctuate uh, from the byproduct of heat from the bioactivity, um, but it won't be getting too hot. Uh, depending on your yeast, when you run at a hotter temperature, it'll stress the yeast um, this can be good because it can embody um, more esters and flavors into your fermentation. Uh, but again, it get, becomes harder to, um, if it's not intentionally warmer, it'll be harder to repeat that for future batches. Um, and then, of course, if, if things become too hot, the yeast will destroy itself and the fermentation will just stop. Um, remember that uh, fermentation that gets too cold can always be warmed again and restarted, whereas 
a fermentation that becomes too hot will require a repitch um, because the yeast has destroyed itself. So depending on um, the type of yeast you use, the, the fermentation time is going to be different, but an average fermentation time should be in the range of two to six days. Again, there's a lot of variables uh, involved in, in material sourcing, yeast sourcing, and what type of rum you're looking to make. Um, the longer you run the fermentation, uh, the more deep acids and esters you're, you're able to include from that yeast. However, you also need to make sure that once you reach your attenuation, that you process the fermentation quickly, again, to prevent any bacteria from consuming the um, flavor or the level of alcohol. This moves us on to distillation. So the most common process for uh, distil distilling sugarcane fermentation is with batch distillation through a variant of a pot still. So rum has a higher separation than grain or fruit-based fruit fermentations, whereas those typically you know, come off the still at around 60%. Rum starts coming out of off the still between 70 and 80% alcohol by volume. In traditional rum distilleries, it's very common to use multiple thump cakes. Um, they're known in the rum making world as a retort. So vapor from the pot still passes through the line arm and enters at the top of the retort. Um, and then the line arm continues below the low wine, uh, low wine water mixture that's um, submerged uh, or, or that charged the, the retort. And what that does is the heat provided from the vapor off the pot still will then boil the first retort and the same process happens again either into a condenser if it's only a one retort system or into uh, the secondary retort. Um, second retort is often charged differently using a mixture of heads and water while as the first retort um, would be just uh, tails and water. If, if you're doing a one retort system, it could be common to have feints or head, a combination of heads and tails uh, be in the, the, the sole retort. Uh, two retort systems are very common, commonly found in uh, Jamaican rum production. So using one retort or, or multiple retorts lessens the need for multiple runs through the pot still because you're getting those, you know, half or secondary and additional distillations all in line. So if you're using a pot still without a retort, it makes sense to do first a stripping run, a run without collecting any cuts, um, collecting until your low wines reaches about 35% alcohol by volume. Then running another run of those low wines, making your cuts, um, you know, starting around 85% and ending the collection, the, the hearts collection at around 65% alcohol by volume. So you, you're looking for your total um, collection vessel to have a range uh, between 70 and 75 percent alcohol by volume. These are just uh, kind of guidelines, like a jumping off point. Well, the more you experience it, the more you taste um, what your 
you know, fermentation is delivering, the more you can shift where you make your cuts and different products can be made with cuts differently depending on your plans for maturation as well. So uh, continuous column stills are a little less popular than, than the traditional pot still, but they're still a viable and, and prominently used method for distilling rum, especially common with large scale operations. So using the column still will result in a much higher distilled product. You know, the TTP, uh, TTB doesn't, uh, does have their requirements that it's not distilled past 95% ABV. So rums distilled to their maximum will still retain some flavor. It's not going to be purely a neutral spirit. Um, you'll be surprised what uh, a difference of, you know, two or 3% actually makes at that level. Um, and then column stills can also be configured to run with fewer plates, almost acting like a pot still themselves. Um, they'll output at a lower strength and retain more flavor and characteristics from the wash. Column stills also lend themselves to the easier use of a vapor basket, which allows for the infusion of flavors especially in spiced and flavor rums, um, you know, with the addition of supplementing other flavors in maceration or eliminating the need for macerations altogether. Additional benefit of running a column still is it isn't necessary to make multiple runs is because the rectifying happens continuously uh, over and over um, in the column itself, uh, kind of eliminating the need for retorts or additional distillation. So when you're done running your distillation, there's um, going to be a lot of things that you should have collected that you can use uh, for other things. Um, so from the end of your first run, your stripping run or, you know, your double retort run, what's left in the pot still or the, the pot of the column still uh, is known as stillage, pot ale, back set. And in the rum world, you heard me um, use the term earlier, dunder. This is where dunder comes from. So fresh dunder can be used in a new batch in combination with water to help prepare the sugar cane. Dunder typically has a pH of around 3.3, so it's, uh, it's fairly acidic. And you can use that in place of um, other additive um, acid controllers. So the Dunder also creates, um, sorry, contains a lot of solid minerals and nutrients uh, that were present during fermentation, as well as, you know, the amino acids uh, from the dead yeast bodies. So fresh dunder is often used to help supplement sugarcane crop fertilization. So in areas where they uh, are lucky enough to have a distillery on a sugarcane farm, essentially the dunder is then dumped back onto the sugarcane fields to replenish nutrients that were removed from the soil in growing the sugarcane. Um, there are benefits and reasons to do this in not just sugarcane fields, but also um, other green spaces or gardens. So currently here at Balmer Peak Distillery, um, we're donating our dunder to five different green spaces to see how, uh, you know, growing crops or maintaining a lawn and other other kind of vegetal growths are impacted in a positive way. Um, perhaps the most interesting use for dunder is to keep it. Uh, keep it in a container or a, a pit outside, you know, if, if that's, uh, if your space is conductive to that. Um, and then what this does 
is it's exposed to the air, wild bacteria, wild yeast that are landing in it, um, propagating, leaving behind deep acids and, and rich esters that then you incorporate back into a new fermentation or um, added to the pot for prior, just prior to your first distillation. Um, this really can embody interesting flavors into your, your final product. Um, and then these muck pits or, or dunder, dunder pits are uh, maintained by, you know, topping them up with dunder, um, adding some kind of sugar source to encourage activity and never fully emptying to um, retain the same bioactivity. So um, collecting the different cuts from the distillation is also beneficial to creating strong flavored rums, um, saving the heads and tails from each run um, and incorporating them in different ways can create more prominent flavors. Uh, it's common to collect the heads and tails together called feints and then doing this over multiple runs until you've collected enough to do an, its own run as just the feints. Um, because there's a natural smear between cuts, you're going to have plenty of hearts um, in with these heads and tail cuts and the concentration of fusel alcohols or fusel oils uh, in these cuts can lead to a much more flavor rich product. Some distilleries call the spirit that they make from the distillation of rum faints, uh, they call it the queen share. So the maturation of rum comes into play similarly to the maturation of other spirits. It's common to let the spirits rest in stainless steel tanks. This practice is pretty standard among a lot of clear spirits because it allows for the flavor of the spirit to mellow out and fully develop its unified flavor before adding it uh, into a bottle or into other flavors. Um, the prolonged exposure to air allows the oxygen to permeate, permeate the solution, which can bring forth a more pronounced flavor and aroma than immediately bottling a spirit after distillation. Resting in, in stainless steel can also be applied um, to rums which have rested in oak containers or wooden containers. Um, the addition of the oxygenation and mellowing helps develop stronger, more desirable tastes and smells. Um, and the resting period allows for more complete integration of the different compounds, again, resulting in a more unified product. When it comes to oak maturation, similar methods to other spirits are used to embody flavor over time. Rum is traditionally added to oak containers, charred oak containers, at around 60% alcohol by volume, kept in those containers for at least six months. The solvent nature of the spirit enters the pores of the wood to extract the flavors and esters from the charred wood. Uh, some of the most common flavors of you know, oak, you know, you'll get that wooded spice, the slightly smoky and vanilla. These flavors are more prominent when using fresh oak containers that haven't been used to mature any other product. Lower, by using a lower strength rum during the oak maturation, you can extract lighter esters, whereas the stronger you know, above 60%, you can extract stronger flavors um, and stronger esters, but also run the risk of, of losing more to the angel's share. Um, when using oak that has been used once previously or, or multiple times, um, the strong oak flavors are going to be much more subdued. This allows for flavors, colors, and esters from 
the product previously occupying the container to add more complexities to the rum. So you'll see uh, rum producers who will age their rum or mature their rum in uh, used wine barrels. Um, you'll get richness um, left behind from the wine and a lot of that color, surprisingly, into the final product. Um, there's a lot of variety um, where wine barrels aren't as common. Um, whiskey, used whiskey barrels are a lot more common, specifically bourbon um, and even brandy, used brandy barrels. So here we have some of the um, you know sensory properties or the different categories of of what rum or rum products can be. Um, so we've got you know starting with what comes off the still as silver or white or light rums. Um, they're often the most immature of the styles, but that does not mean that they lack uh, body complexity or flavor. Um, Contrary to that kind of general stigma of a clear spirit lacks complexity. Um, while a lot of rums do harbor a mild sweet flavor, especially in this category, um, I, I, it, just because they lack the colors of their aged brethren doesn't mean they lack the complexity. A lot of white rums, in fact, are actually rested and matured in oak and then carbon filtered to remove that color, which is picked up during aging. So I mentioned earlier that in Canada, rum needs to rest in a barrel for a specified period of time. Well, that color or that, that barrel adds color to the rum and rum producers still want to produce a white or light rum and they will carbon filter that out. Um, it's very interesting uh, to see. Um, white rums uh, also have the benefit of being able to be fermented um, or distilled with dunder. So we were talking about dunder and the kind of complexities that that adds, um, a spiciness sometimes or a, a bold... Uh, vegetal forward flavor that you typically would expect from a rum agricole, you could get from a a um, a dunder rum that hasn't hasn't been aged. Again, uh, like the Brazilian cachaça uh, and many many of the rum agricoles, they're going to be in this silver, white, and light category. Um, but I want to reinforce that the color or the lack thereof does not mean the spirit is lacking, lacking complexity or death. Even if this category of rum has a larger reputation for being used mostly in mixed drinks. So um, next we'll see most often dark amber and golden rums. So these are a little different depending on where you are and who made it and who wanted to put what on the label. But essentially, it, it just comes from the color of the product in the bottle. And most of the time, that color deri is derived from maturing in oak vessels. So they have a reputation of being uh, deeper and more complex but again, you shouldn't judge it solely by color because a lot of rum producers are unhappy at the color of the rum after they extract it from the oak container and bring it down to bottle proof. It, it might be too light in color for their liking. So using caramelized um, sugarcane or even molasses as a coloring aid agent and to add body um, they will add it back into the uh, product prior to bottling and then running it through um, a particle filter so um, 
some some flavors to to expect um, and smells obviously are going to come from the oak so uh, oak spice um, to, you know toasted sugar um, vanilla and sometimes depending on how long they'll age you'll still have the 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 sweet potentially fruity um, base of the of the white spirit um, so spiced rums are kind of the most common of the flavored variety and can still remain in a US recognized rum category um, there's plenty of variety to be had here but the most common flavors for spicing a rum are going to be things like cinnamon vanilla um, you know a variety of peppercorns cardamom there's uh, you know ginger you're going to get a lot of those kinds of flavors depending on what direction the um, spiced rum has been taken in uh, a lot of the kind of mass produced spice rums are flavored with concentrates and extracts. Uh, it makes sense at a, at a large scale, but it's really been interesting to see how cra the craft market has improved these flavor qualities by using fresh or whole ingredients um, to deliver more depth and complexities um, to their white rums without having to need um, to spend the time for other maturation methods. Um, and then we've got this kind of weird category of flavored rums. Uh, so they're different, they're actually a different classification than, than rum because they're typically bottled below the allowed 40%, uh, often in the 30 to 35%, it's almost like a liqueur. These rums have taken a page out of the vodka playbook and often the base spirit has been distilled to as strong as the TTB allows. That's to say 95% alcohol by volume because this allows for the added flavors to be the standout focus. Um, tons of varieties here, tropical varieties, flavors that are associated with the countries that rum is uh, most known for including like coconut, mango, banana. Large scale producers, again, will be using extracts and concentrates to achieve their desired flavor profile. However, smaller producers are using fresher whole ingredients to embody a, a higher craft quality. So uh, that's pretty much it. If you're curious to read more about the rum production, here are a couple books that go into uh, more depth on different topics. The Distillery's Guide to Rum is a great jumping off point for the ins and outs across the mechanical processes and procedures of rum making. And uh, the Complete Book of Spirits, a guide to their history, production, and enjoyment provides a brief glimpse into the origins of rums and offers important consumer-facing um, ideas, opinions, and information uh, instead of being focusedly, focused entirely on the production side. Uh, I hope you all learned something valuable about the rum making process and please feel free to reach out with any other uh, questions about rum or distilling. Thanks.